sense of what um, the conditions are like um, for um, climate change.
Uh, like, there are universals, right? Like, lots of abuse, lots of displacement, lots of pain and suffering, and the way that's happening um, in every community and in every location is different. Um, uh, where I live in Tucson um, and in the area that No More Deaths works, um, so we're a group that puts food and water out in the desert for people who have chosen to walk across the desert. Um, those are long and arduous journeys, and many people don't make that, um, don't survive the journey. Um, from where we sit, um, it's a crisis that's been going on for two decades now, two decades plus, and it shows no sign of abating. Um, I think that with the way that the Migrant Protection Protocols Program, which um, is a program that was put into place in the last six months and requires that migrants who are waiting to cross through a port of entry um, to make an asylum claim, they have to wait in Mexico. And increasingly, their asylum claims are being heard in these like uh, tent courts where there are lawyers who are like Skyping in, immigration lawyers who are like Skyping in from major cities such as San Francisco and New York and immigration judges who are Skyping in and lawyers who are like going to the border to try to meet with their clients aren't allowed to meet with their clients for about more than 15 minutes because CBP will uh, deem it a security threat, um, right? So it's like, it's like insane fascism um, and um, you know, there's like thousands of people camped out of the border, just like waiting on these lists, like waiting every day in these tent camps um, with very little access to food, very little access to water. And whether or not that's going to result in like more people trying to cross on foot outside of the port of entry remains to be seen. A lot of them are women, a lot of them are children. Um, and so the population we've seen walking across the desert historically has have been those you know single young men um, who are fleeing violence and seeking economic opportunity. But it's also all kinds of people, right? And so like um, earlier this year, there was a young uh, mother from India and her two children who tried to cross, and her six-year-old daughter ended up dying in the desert. Um, there's a lot of people who. Uh, grew up here, have families here, and have been deported, um, and are trying to make their way back to their families, um, you know, including families in southern Arizona. So my friends, last year, um, there was a man who was found who, like, um, had lived in Phoenix for 20 years as an undocumented person and as a father and was deported and was trying to make his way back to Phoenix and died along the journey. Um, so there's not, I think there's like an image of who walks across the desert and um, the reality is like uh, it's a lot of different people who are crossing for a lot of different reasons. Um, and then, uh, you know, we work with no numerous border communities as well and I think in a lot of those communities like the, um, the, mm -hmm. like border, the border has been being increasingly militarized for um, decades since 9-11 happened and even before then um, and but the actual like physical like presence of militarization of border patrol in these communities of um, right like new wall infrastructure growing up of new surveillance infrastructure growing up of them putting out like um, like five layers of cantina wire on a wall that was there before like there's these like visual markers um, that are uh, ever encroaching and ever more sort of like cementing the, it's more than an aesthetic, it's like an um, existential orientation of like our border being this militarized war zone. Um, so that type of stuff is happening every day, changing every day, um, a lot of it goes up without like consulting with local authorities or local community members. Um, the wall that they're building right now, right, that is like the wall that replaced the wall that replaced the vehicle barrier that replaced the border patrol truck, um, you know, is like going up rapidly. There's like a 
list of how many laws the Trump administration had to violate in order to be building the wall in some of the places that they are. And it's like, it's literally like 30 laws, you know? Um, all sorts of environmental regulations, all sorts of like, um, uh, archit, uh, what's the word? Where you like excavate archeology, span right? Like these like regulations around like how you have to like survey land before you like dig it up, all these like native um, rights protections. And they're just uh, literally bulldozing through all of those protections that the US government has put in place to protect against things like this happening. So um, I'd say what's happening along the border is like an explosion of a neurotic dream um, that is reacting to this imagined threat um, of these like foreign invaders coming to like penetrate our borders, right? This sort of very like gendered sexual imagining of like what the um, what this imagined line between nations is, right? That like uh, is hyper reactive and, uh, in my opinion, hyper neurotic. I'll stop there. Can everyone hear? Yes. Great. Um, so, what we're seeing the border is a human rights crisis. It is a legal crisis, as we see protections for migrants all but being obliterated. And it's really a crisis of our national conscience and the kind of America that we want to be. We have seen over the past several years a rollout of policies and laws that are being rolled out for the purpose of keeping out asylum seekers and largely keeping out more brown immigrant bodies, right? Um, because we are currently being run by an administration uh, that is hell-bent on white nationalism and fascism and has a vested interest in keeping out as many brown bodies as possible. And what does that look like on the ground? Uh, right now, uh, we have a wait list to seek asylum at the border. Under U.S. federal law, technically, a asylum seeker can walk up to an immigration officer either at the entry or anywhere along the border if they're entering illegally, as they would say, we prefer to say irregularly, um, and say, I'm an asylum seeker. I fear going back to my country. Um, I would like to speak with an asylum officer. That's the law. Uh, right now, though, we have a wait list where people must go and put their name in a, in a notebook that is sometimes run by Mexican government officials, sometimes run by a shelter, and they must wait. And oftentimes they must wait for months. Now the US-Mexico border has some of the most dangerous cities in the world. And we are having vulnerable people, families with young children, elderly people, disabled people, LGBTQ, people, unaccompanied minors traveling without their parents, perhaps the most vulnerable among us, waiting in these border cities for sometimes as long as six months just to be able to talk with an American officer. Um, one of the earlier panelists mentioned the migrant protection protocols. It's also known in the news media as Remain in Mexico policy. However, advocates on the ground working this issue, we refer to it as the migrant persecution protocols. Because what that policy does, it doesn't protect migrants, it puts them in an even more dangerous position. And how does that work on the ground? So um, I'm an asylum seeker. I've waited five months in Tijuana for my turn to talk with an American official. And after I tell them a little bit about my story, they stamp my documents and they send me back to Mexico to the dangers that I was just fleeing, where I have to wait for my turn again to have a court hearing, or rather a series of court hearings, which can sometimes take as long as a year to complete an asylum case. And in between those few things, I'm being forced back into Mexico. And what is the practical effect of this for my legal case? I have no access to counsel, because there are very few attorneys that are willing to take these cases and willing to come to Mexico. I am most likely living in a shelter or some very unstable housing situation sharing with other people. Perhaps I'm even hopeless. I and mean, we do have many clients that are going to their court proceedings with their children after sleeping on the street. I am probably hungry. If I'm working, I'm in a job that exploits me. Um, and in some circumstances, I'm being trafficked. 
Uh, we are seeing in a rise on the border for those who are suffering from migrant persecution protocols of people being kidnapped, people being trafficked. Particularly, we see a spike in kidnapping of families with young children or young children themselves, and that's because the border is a hub for sexual exploitation, sexual trafficking, and the production of child pornography. Mexican authorities are very well aware of what is going on um, in the crime spike that's being seen against migrants and the increase in, in traffickers and cartels just snatching them off the street. Um, but they are both unwilling to attack the problem because many of them are corrupt themselves and are in collaboration with some of these more organized crime syndicates, or they're simply unable. Um, and the United States government is forcing this policy upon Mexico, forcing Mexico to essentially become a refugee camp and awaiting them. Last summer, we saw the rollout of the family separation policy. Uh, what I want to say about that is that we actually on the border in Tijuana saw families being separated, children being ripped from their parents one year before Jeff Sessions announced the policy. And it wasn't until we saw this mass separation of children, thousands of children, um, that everyone woke up to what was happening. And under international law, the forcible separation of families, the forcible removal of children from families can be considered an act of genocide. So I just want everyone to sit with that for a second. We are the United States of America. We are the country that goes to war to protect freedom, supposedly. And we are committing acts of genocide. And no one is holding us accountable. And those that are attempting to hold the government accountable, journalists, activists, attorneys such as myself, pastors, we have all been placed on a watch list. There's currently a watch list that is operated by the US and the Mexico government, which when it first came out was 59 people, including myself and my two co-directors, but it probably includes many more. And each of us have our own secret dossier. This information is leaked to uh, NBC in March. My dossier contains my mother's maiden name, my mother, where she lives um, in New Jersey, my car, my international travel history, including travel which did not originate in the United States, but originated in Mexico. So I trip to Guatemala to interview parents and locate parents who have been separated from their children telling us that this is a joint intelligence operation between the Mexican and the U.S. government. Now, many people may ask, well, what does Mexico get out of this? Money. They get money out of this. Because the U.S. constantly threatens to close the border, to impact trade, and the Mexican economy is dependent upon U.S. tourism, it's dependent upon U.S. trade, it's dependent upon U.S. companies opening up their factories. And so the Mexican government has made a choice that money is more important than people, including some of its own citizens, many of them who are fleeing the states of Michoacan, Guerrero, and Veracruz to escape the drug war. Um, and so that is where we are at the border. Um, we are in the midst of a crisis, and there's different elements to this crisis. Uh, and it's incredibly frustrating um, to see our Congress <coughs> so impotent. Um, my co-director has done a lot of lobbying on the Hill, and what we're hearing from Congress is that they don't feel like they can pass a bill because of the composition of, of the Senate. They don't feel like they can do anything. Um, well, I'm sorry. We elected you to do something. Even if you fail, we elected you to do something. We elected you to speak out. But Congress, many of them are so concerned with holding on to the little bits of power that all of these people at the bottom who have no voice, who aren't citizens, who aren't white, who don't speak English, who are really the victims of our own foreign policy that are arriving to us for protection, um, they don't matter. And so if I can implore you to do anything today, it's to do something to show these people that they matter, to show them that we are not a country that will allow genocide to be committed in our um, Thanks to all of you. That was, um, as I had expected, incredibly moving and informative. Um, before we dive a little deeper, I just wanted to ask you to talk briefly 
I think you each touched on this. Marlena talked about how this has been going on for 20 years. Just to think about the continuities and discontinuities. How is this administration following a trajectory of what we've seen over time? How is this administration different? What are you seeing um, in terms of changes at the board? Um, um, I lived in the border for 11 years, so I got uh, I arrived in New Mexico in 2008 where we had the peak of the narco violence in Mexico. So it was very, very dangerous in Ciudad Juarez um, at that point in time. So there was a lot of issues happening there between the drug cartels and, you know, the border. And, and a lot of the emphasis was more trying to control that, um, the massive borders that were happening in Ciudad Juarez. It was not even in our side of the border. So that was where the focus was. People have to understand that individuals who live in border cities, there is a fusion there. Those borders are kind of non-existent. Every single day, thousands, thousands of U.S. citizens cross the Mexico border for work, for doing business, or because they have family members, and the other way around. So a lot of the border towns, we're used to that. So back in 2008, I think that the, the at least in, in El Paso area, you know, the issue was, you know, how are we going to prevent, you know, this, this violence that is happening in Mexico? And when a lot of the immigration happened, uh, people from Juarez and Chihuahua and other areas coming to us, it was, you know, how we can support these individuals and my specialty is with kiddos, you know, how are we going to help these kids process the level of trauma and the level of violence that they're witnessing and how we can be supportive of them? So fast forward that. And, you know, we have talked about it before. You know, immigration laws have been here for a long time. But that depends on who's in the government. Let's face it. For a lot of people, Obama was a really good person, and he was. But there was a lot of deportations that happened under his administration. So what ended happening is we have a new government where, obviously, it's pretty right when, you know, he, uh, Donald Trump is appealing to his base. He was the one who was bold enough to put out there issues that people were afraid to talk about. So, uh, you know, I think that one talked about something in his keynote that is true. There's a lot of good people here in the United States. And in order for us to address this, we have to understand history. We, we come or we live in a land of immigrants. This country was built on immigrants and our indigenous people who we're subjected to mass genocide, and now we have them in reservation. So we have to take ownership of that. But putting that aside, so fast forward, so we elect President Trump. What, what he decided to do is that he needs to appeal to his base. So all of a sudden, all these laws who were flawed anyways, now they're worst. Because as Marilena was saying, what we have done now is we're criminalizing the immigrants. So what we have right now is, as she described, the same thing is in El Paso area, Ciudad Juarez, wire fencing, a strong show of military and border patrol agents, and overnight, they have built these walls that we don't even know how they got the permits to them. So the message is very clear. We need, we want all these brown people to stay away from here because you're all criminals, you're all smugglers, you're not contributing to society, you're going to be a burden to society. When in reality, we know that a lot of these immigrants, whether they are documented or undocumented, they, they pay taxes. They do work here. They're contributing to our economy. So we need to stop saying that they're taking away our jobs. You know, obviously, maybe we won't agree in the way that they're entering this country. But we're humans, and we're losing humanity in this process. And that's the problem. We started criminalizing the immigrants and we're dehumanizing the process. When you separate a child, a three month old, a newborn, a two year old from the mothers, we're causing a lot of trauma. How that's different when you have an orphanage full of kiddos whose parents had been, you know, think about concentration camps. What kind of damage we're doing? At that point, we're not thinking about that. When you strip a baby from their mother's arms, we're causing a lot of harm. And yes, a lot of these kids are resilient and they're able to bounce back. But we should not base our policies on the fact, yes, they will recover. You're right. With time, 
the last thing I want to say, the last thing I observed, and I don't know if this is the same thing in Tijuana or even in Arizona, I was appalled. The last trip that I had to Ciudad Juarez, we decided to go, but, but we crossed the bridge. So in our way back, we were holed in the bridge. I want you all to visualize somebody in the bridge, like literally there in the middle of the Rio Branch. We were held there hostage, I will say it hostage, for an hour and a half because the military and the Border Patrol wanted to do um, an exercise. And they're practicing how to deal in a riot situation. So I want you to picture the U.S.-Mexico border bridge with wire fencing. We have over 50, 60 officers in military gear with weapons doing all this exercise. There was smoke, everything, that, that was loud. There was helicopters flying around. They were just showing us, okay, people, you better stay there and don't be too much because we show our disprobato. All, all I can think of, my goodness, this is what this government wants to portray, disprobato. Don't mess with us because obviously the person that we have in power, he's an egomaniac that his ego is so frail that he has to use that to intimidate people. Let's be real, how many people who were there in the bridge who already have their documents were able to do that? But no, we had to tell them, don't do that because we're gonna show all this force on you. That's what the El Paso um, Juarez Mexico border looks like in July of 2019. Okay, I'm going to answer the historical part first. Um, so I like to start, there used to not be a border, because um, there used to not be these countries. Uh, and I think it's incredibly important to ground any analysis in that, right? It's an invented line um, that is enforced by violence due to political and economic interests of, like, the project of global nationalism and nation states. Um, that said, um, no more deaths focus is on the policy of prevention through deterrence, which was put into effect through administrative order um, by what was uh, INS at that time, um, which was a policy, it was put into effect um, at the same time that NAFTA came into law in 1994, because the forces that created NAFTA understood that it would create economic instability in Mexico, which would result in greater migration into the United States. So the policy of prevention through deterrence um, basically walled off these traditional migration routes in urban centers. And the theory was that if enough people were pushed into remote terrain in order to migrate into this country, um, that enough of them would die, it would act as a deterrent to future migration, and migration numbers would um, dip uh, after that. It has been publicly named a failed policy by people who were employed by INS and um, involved in the implementation who signed off on it at that time, um, who have recognized that all it has done has created a crisis of death and disappearance in our southwest borderlands and has in fact not deterred migration at all. Um, but it was an intentional move by our government to employ death as a deterrent or the threat of death as, um, to, as a deterrent to migration. Um, so that has been in place for over 20 years at this point. Um, and um, I think that, uh, right, like the historical trajectory um, from before then, marked by that project, marked by projects such as Operation Gatekeeper, Operation Hold the Line, all these sort of like experimental models that our border enforcement has used um, up to the point of September 11th, at which point like um, money in our federal budget for militarizing our border really um, increased exponentially. Um, up till now, like there has been an increasing project by our nation to turn our border into a militarized zone of like um, highly racialized um, and uh, yeah, highly abusive um, immigration enforcement practices. I think what is new under this administration is um, 
in general, a willingness to be lawless about it, and to be very publicly lawless about it, and to uh, uh, really give no, um, uh, have no regard for any of the many things that could potentially hold, hold in check the extent of the abuses that are happening at the moment. For us at No More Deaths, what's new under this administration is federal prosecution of our volunteers. Um, and so that has looked like, um, it's manifested in a number of ways. Uh, the first thing that happened was we have a camp about 15 miles north of the border in the desert. It was a, a desert aid station operative for about 10 years um, and the first summer that uh, Trump came into office, Border, border Patrol for years has, um, you know, like they've surrounded the camp, they've intimidated our volunteers, they've surveilled and harassed, they've set up um, trail cams to track people going into camp, they've threatened to get warrants to enter the camp, but they never have um, up until that summer. And that summer, the, on two different occasions, they surrounded the camp. And on the second occasion, they got a warrant and entered and detained four individuals receiving care. So that really shifted um, sort of the, uh, our ability to give work out of that space and to do work and to give effective aid because there's no way to give effective aid when your patient could be deported at any moment and Border Patrol can interfere with your activities in any moment. Um, so that was the first thing and then around um, uh, around December, January, a number of our volunteers started getting summons to appear on federal misdemeanor charges for leaving water out in designated wilderness areas. Um, and then in January of 2017, we released a report accompanied by a video that went viral um, that just documented Border Patrol's efforts to interfere with with our humanitarian aid efforts in the video, I'm sure a lot of you have seen it, it's like trail cam footage, right? So going back to his, his, the historical aspect, it's trail cam footage that was actually collected under the Obama administration of Border Patrol like kicking over water gallons or like picking up blankets and food that we left out and removing them, like these active efforts to um, thwart us. <laughs> um, so we released that video along with the re report detailing our findings and that afternoon they arrested one of our volunteers in a small town um, in Arizona called Ajo and uh, he was indicted on two counts of felony harboring and one count of felony conspiracy um, for offering aid to two men from Central America. So that um, for us is new under this administration but Border Patrol's interference with our efforts um, and their consistent human rights abuses have been a hallmark of the agency under every administration preceding this one. And I think they're just on overdrive. You know, um, you know, there was a border patrol agent who, um, in the Tucson sector, who uh, said to actually a comrade in a fellow organization. Um, after um, basically he was like, "We're gonna go after no more deaths." Like now the club gloves come. Now the gloves come off after um, Trump was elected. So there's, you know, there's this, I think, really clear um, sort of like, there's been the existence of abuse and cruelty in that agency since its inception, and now it's just on hyperdrive. In 2014, so I've been here five years. I had the time to observe it under both the Obama administration and the Trump administration. And I think um, advocates, because we're living through a nightmare that is the Trump administration, have a tendency to romanticize the Obama years, or, or the media does that as well. Um, but there's a reason why we call President Obama the deporter in chief. Because he deported more people than any other president in US history. And the border just isn't about migrants, asylum seekers come north. It's also about people being deported south, being ripped away from their communities and their families and exiled to lands of which they know very little about or have very little contact with. Um, what we saw under the Obama administration is two narratives, so it's essentially speaking out of both sides of this map. Um, we have this narrative that we want to protect immigrants who have 
foreign relationships, foreign to communities in the United States, but really what that is, is that's a narrative about good immigrants. That's a narrative about dreamers um, and for people maybe who have you know, had a couple of minor offenses. That's not a narrative about asylum seekers, not a narrative about maybe someone that had a drug offense, had um, a, a, a theft offense, but has a family here, has a U.S. citizen children, has a U.S. citizen spouse, has a job, has people who care about them. And so what Obama did is they made a decision of which immigrants' lives matter, which don't, and um, largely sold out the immigrant community, even though he campaigned on the backs of the Latino population. There's a reason why we have all those posters, he said, well, and that was a lie. And unfortunately, that is um, a lie that probably will be forgotten in history as we continue to work our way through the hell that is the current administration. Under the former administration, there was um, a wait list still for asylum seekers. They were just rolling it out. It wasn't across the border wide. It was just in Tijuana. And interestingly enough, at first it just applied to Haitians, so black migrants. Um, and then it expanded to include other African asylum seekers because for Mexican officials, everyone was black. Um, and so you had this dual process being rolled out in Tijuana where other asylum seekers could technically go ask for asylum at the port of entry and try to be processed, although many times they were turned away. And black migrants had to get on a wait list and had to wait months in order to access the process. So it's really interesting that that process was unfolded un under a time when we had a black president. Um, and that allowing that process to begin has set the stage for President Trump and this wait list to be rolled out borderline um, and made months long. Um, and I talk a lot about this wait list probably because our organization is suing the government about the wait list and I'm a bit obsessed with it. Um, but because the U.S. government would have us believe it doesn't have the capacity to process those who are coming to our border seeking protection. We have the capacity to build a base in Iraq in less than three weeks because we want to protect oil and want to go to war. We can't process a few hundred refugees out of port entry on a daily basis. When we are one of the most wealthiest governments in the planet, we are one of the most powerful, one of the most organized, although sometimes it does feel like we are you know, operating some kind of kangaroo court. Um, and they would have us believe that, that we can't process people quickly and with dignity. Uh, and they set the capacity levels for processing asylum seekers at artificially low levels, and on some days they don't take anyone, including Christmas, New Year's, Easter, World Refugee Day, on the day that we celebrate refugees and their resilience and their struggles to survive worldwide, and on the 4th of July, the day that we celebrate winning our own freedom from Britain. Um, and those are not necessarily things that we just didn't have capacity. Those are messages to the waiting population seeking asylum that even on these important days, these holy days, these days on which are most revered, we are going to show them exactly how much we don't want them here. Under the, uh, under the Obama administration, we also saw the rise in the family detention centers. So we see this media narrative of babies in cages, babies in cages. If you want to blame someone for babies in cages, you need to go blame President Obama. Essentially, President Obama took a, a firearm that I was disassembled and just put the pieces right next to each other, barely touching. And what President Toddler Trump has done is he's just put it together and he's just, just shooting bullets out into the crowd without any sort of discrimination. Um, and so this narrative has been, has been going on, as some of the other panelists mentioned, for over two decades. We've seen this rollout of this narrative of immigrants that are coming to commit crimes, they're coming to take our jobs, they're coming to take welfare and vote at, in our elections. Um, and it's just simply not true. Um, all of the immigrants that I work with in Tijuana, which at this point now has has been over 4,000 um, just in the last year alone. They are coming 
not because they want to come. No one wants to travel thousands of miles and leave their home. And many of them, you know, they live in beautiful countries, they have beautiful cultures, they, they have family, they have community, um, they have great food. They don't want to leave that to come to a place that doesn't want them. And they know it doesn't want them. But they feel like it is one of the few places that is accessible to them, because Europe is not accessible, in which they can find some measure of freedom, some measure of safety, and where there is at least some modicum of respect for the rule of law. Um, under the Obama administration, we saw um, our government support a coup in Honduras, which is known as the Golpe de Estado. We helped um, the, those who initiated the coup to remove a duly elected president. And now we are upset um, as a nation, as, 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 a, as um, you know, as a, a administration, that we have thousands of Hondurans coming to our border.